Hi all, I'm Steph Tola, and as Ross said, I'm a postdoc at Queen Mary University of London. Um, and that's actually where I also did my um, PhD. Um, so today I'll be presenting some of my, primarily my postdoc research, but because um, I only started in January, I'll fill it in a little bit with um, some of my PhD research. So I'll be talking to you about dimethyl sulfide or DMS as it's most commonly referred to. Now, joining this, when, when I was speaking to Rose, I wasn't actually sure how much you'd know about my field, which is a uh, microbial ecology with more like, let's say molecular, more modern, let's say molecular techniques. Um, so I tried to, to organize this presentation into a bit more of a primer to basically show you what kind of techniques I use every day in the lab. Um, so yeah, so I'll I'll go straight in. So DMS, DMS is the smell of the sea. Um, it's basically, we we always associate it with the smell of the seaside. And I'm sure all of you can uh, um, recollect times when you've been, uh, when you've experienced this. So with my presentation, um, you'll hopefully learn about how this smell of the sea um, can lead to methane, a major greenhouse gas in sediments lacking oxygen. Um, sediments lacking oxygen can also be called uh, called anoxic sediments. So if you hear me uh, um, refer to them as anoxic sediments throughout, you know, it's basically sediments with no oxygen. Um, so before I go into more details about my research, no, my keyboard doesn't, there we go. Um, let me show you these photos. What could the common link be? We have a seal in the sea, we have beer, we have seafood, we have Brussels sprouts and cheese. Now, surprisingly, when I first started at my PhD, I realized that the common link throughout these is DMS. So DMS is released during the beer and cheese making process um, via the fermentation that happens when we try and produce these, um, these products. It's also the very characteristic bad smell of overboiled cabbage and corn and seafood. So it can be found pretty much everywhere. And actually in America, they sometimes use it as a, a food additive because they think it makes uh, food taste better. Um, naturally, DMS precursors, so the molecules that break down and lead to the production of DMS in the environment, are produced by tiny photosynthetic microorganisms called phytoplankton. Once this phytoplankton gets eaten by larger organisms, like fish, for example, they release these DMS precursors into the water, which can then be broken down by bacteria, um, producing loads of DMS in the water column. And this DMS can be detected by foraging seabirds and seals, and it basically tells them, ah, follow this smell because it will lead you to food. You know that if you get to the source, you will find fish. So basically it acts as a signal to larger animals. So we basically come into contact with DMS quite often. So where can we find it in the environment? What is its cycle? Um, there we go. Um, so this is its biogeochemical cycle. <clears throat> now, um, so this is this shows basically what I was showing to you. Let me try and change uh, laser pointer. There we go. Um, what I was showing you: um, phytoplankton, bacteria, and other microorganisms release DMS precursors. Um, and actually, the largest source of sort of uh, DMS in the environment is DMSP. And DMSP not only can be produced by phytoplankton, but it can also be produced by plants, especially plants that can be found in salt marshes. So this DMSP, DM, DMSP can lead to the production of millions of tons of DMS in the environment and in the water column. And about 10% of that DMS can then be released into the atmosphere um, where it can where it actually um, is the largest source of sulfur in the atmosphere. Then it can uh, create complexes with ozone, which is also very abundant in the atmosphere, and create sulfate aerosols. And a lot of these sulfate aerosols lead to, cl to, lead to cl uh, cloud formation. <clears throat> and a lot of clouds 
means that less radiation from the sun is ends up on the in the earth and um, heating up the planet. Basically, the clouds um, reflect the radiation back in the stratosphere. So this is what happens in uh, in the water. And as we all know, water contains oxygen. But I'm talking to you about sediments with no oxygen. So these guys. So sediments uh, with no oxygen or anoxic sediments are normally two to four centimeters below the surface. And they're normally characterized by a dark, a dark color. It's normally quite black but because of uh, chemical um, um, reactions that happen there. So here, <clears throat> we don't actually know if DMSP is still a major DMS precursor. So we don't really know how DMS is produced in the environment, in the sediments. We know that a lot of it, so 90% of it, will eventually end up being buried in the sediment, but we don't actually know how it's created. So part of my postdoc is to try and understand if DMSP is also a major DMS precursor in uh, these anoxic sediments. What we do know, however, is that about 40 to 50 years ago, research conducted showed that DMS can lead uh, to the production of methane and carbon dioxide, two greenhouse gases. And we also know that the microbes that do this are either methanogens, so methane producers, or sulfate-reducing bacteria. Now, sulfate-reducing bacteria are normally found in saline ecosystems like oceans and salt marshes because they require sulfate, hence salinity, to survive, right? Whereas methanogens, on the other hand, don't need, um, don't need this. They can, they can survive anywhere, but, they are to um, but oxygen is toxic to them. And that's why we're trying to find them in sediments like in oxygen. So the major question that we're trying to answer is how a climate cooling gas can lead to the production of two major greenhouse gases in uh, sediments like in oxygen. So that is the aim of my project. So overall, <clears throat> I wanna monitor the cycling of DMSP and DMS to understand the production and degradation uh, rates of these organ of these compounds. That's what turnover rates means. Then I'm interested in exploring the diversity and the metabolism of these microorganisms to basically understand who, who does it and how. I'm also curious to test whether environmental conditions can affect DMS and DMSP degradation. So basically with climate change, does um, could it lead to more methane production? Could it lead to more carbon dioxide? Or does this, um, this process not happen at all? And lastly, I would like to predict how much DMS-dependent methane production is contributed to global methane emissions. And this hasn't really been done before, so, um, so I'm, I'm very curious to see how it goes. But this is basically the overarching project aim of my postdoc. So, and I only just started in January, so I'll only be focusing on these two, which means that my presentation aim turns into monitor the cycling of DMSP and DMS to explore the potential for their degradation, the diversity and metabolism of the, the active DMS and DMSP degrading microorganisms in sediments with no oxygen. Now I've highlighted active here, but I will tell you about a bit more about this later on in the presentation. So let's check out the first thing, the first aim. More, explore the potential for DMS and DMSP degradation. So to explore this, we first need to go sampling. Now, throughout the presentation, I will show you results from two sampling sites, a salt marsh and the Baltic Sea. Um, both have brackish salinity, so they are have an intermediate salinity which basically means we can explore both the methanogens and the sulfate producing bacteria. Um, <clears throat> and also in both these uh, sampling sites, DMSP has been found in high amounts. So we know that DMSP is there, which could lead to DMS, and that DMS could then lead to methane or carbon dioxide. So let's go sampling. So first we have Batis Marsh, uh, which I think is a pretty cool name. 
Um, so this is a uh, salt moss down in Rochester in Kent. Um, and this is basically a very typical um, salt moss uh, photo. So you can see all, all these water channels. So it is pretty dangerous to go sampling here because yes, you can see these guys, but this is also a water channel. This is also one. And this is a great big hole, <laughs> which means it's very dangerous to go sampling there. So please don't, uh, don't go uh, exploring. Um, so what we do once we get there is we use corals like these, which are basically fancy straws, and we collect sediment. So we end up with a quarter or a carrot, as we like to call them. And here you can see what I was talking, talking to you about earlier. So um, you can see this nice brown color, which is normally what we associate with soil and sediment. And down here, which is uh, deeper in the sediment, it, it turns black because it's, it's most likely anoxic. And then <clears throat> we have the Baltic Sea. So the Baltic Sea, again, it's a pretty similar site like uh, the salt marsh, but it's cooler to go to because instead of randomly exploring and trying to avoid holes, we just take a boat, this boat to be exact. And we use this crane to load a nice corner here, as you can see, which we then take into the sea, we lower down, and we end up with another corner, exactly the same as before. And again, here you can see it's nice and sandy at the top and completely dark at the bottom. Um, and just for your information, this quarter is about 80 centimeters long. So once back in the lab, the process for both of these sampling sites is exactly the same. We basically poke the carrot out of the column, we slice it up and plop it in the incubation vials like this, like serum vials. We add a bit of media um, to basically give the organisms uh, the necessary nutrients and vitamins that they need to survive. And we make these vials anaerobic or uh, anoxic. So we remove the oxygen um, using gas and then we keep them closed. So some of these vials will be, uh, in, will inject DMS and DMSP in them and monitor how, using gas chromatography, how DMS is degraded or produced and how methane and carbon dioxide uh, are produced as well. So this is the setup I had for my PhD and about three months ago we elevated. We, uh, we ended up with this fancy thing which has a nice touch screen but at the end of the day the process is exactly the same. So let me walk you through how gas chromatography works. So this is a very simplified schematic from Bite Size Bio. Um, so a uh, gas chromatographer has a constant gas flow. Um, it's called a carrier gas because this gas literally carries your sample from the ejection port through the column all the way to the detector and then into waste. So we inject some sample, in our case, a small gas sample from our serum vials into the ejection port and the carrier gas carries it through the oven and into the column. <clears throat> In the column, everything mixes together. Um, and because of the heat, different molecules end up sticking to the column at different times. So for, so for example, let's say that our column is size specific, right? So let's make it a bit, a bit easier. So we have a size specific column and we have a gas uh, sample that contains a coconut, a watermelon and a lemon. A watermelon and a lemon. Um, so the carrier gas takes this sample through the column and because the column uh, likes um, um, separates the gases out depending on the size, of, uh, the lemon will go out faster because it's smaller than the coconut, than the watermelon. And basically this is what happens. This is what we do to try and separate the DMS from the carbon, mono from the carbon dioxide and the methane. So let's look but some of the results. So from Batis Mars, excuse me, when we incubate with the MSP, this is sort of the graph that we get. So here for simplicity, I've colored DMS with black and it's on this axis and methane with this dotted red line. So as you can see at time zero, um, so day zero, we inject DMS, the MSP and DMS increases. 
The DMS then is degraded or is broken down by the microbes. We inject more DMSP, the DMS increases again, the DMS it decreases again, and so on and so forth until 70 days have gone by. And throughout this process, because DMS is going down, we can also see methane being produced and accumulating in the bottles. When we do the same process, uh, but this time with, uh, with DMS, we see, again, a similar thing. We add DMS, the DMS goes down because it's degraded. We add more DMS, the DMS goes down again, and so on and so forth, and we see methane being ac accumulated. And interestingly, we see more methane being produced in these incubations, even though similar amounts have been injected, uh, which, uh, which is interesting. And uh, basically shows that the microbes might be more used to having DMS around rather than DMSP. So what about the Baltic Sea? The Baltic Sea, here we only run incubations with DMS. We didn't really think about doing DMSP incubations at the time. But again, it, it's a, a pretty similar picture. We add DMS, the DMS goes down. We add more DMS, the DMS goes down again because it's been broken down by the microbes and methane accum accumulates in the vials. Now, what I did do, even though I didn't run DMSP incubations, is I measured the DMSP in the environment. So this is the, the uh, depth profile of, for DMSP, and it's in centimeters below the seafloor. That's what BSF means. Um, so at the at zero here is the seafloor, and at 80 at the bottom is 80 centimeters below the seafloor. And we can see that DMSP exists is there in pretty high concentrations. So we assume that if we incubate with the MSP, there are microbes there with the potential to degrade it. So with that, we've pretty much explored my first presentation aim. These um, sites do have the potential to degrade DMS and DMSP and leading to the production of um, methane, of methane, not carbon dioxide though, because we didn't actually see it in the incubations. So how do we explore the diversity and the metabolism of these microorganisms? And this brings me to the active part um, of this aim. Now, just because we see DMS going up and then DMS going down and then methane being produced, it doesn't mean that the microbes inside are actively degrading the DMS. It doesn't mean that they're actively degrading the DMS and leading to the production of methane. It could, it could be a chemical process. It, there could be something else in the sediments that lead to the production of methane. So for that reason, we need to understand if there are active microorganisms doing the job in these um, sediments. So to do this, we use the absolutely fiddliest technique, um, which is actually pretty cool as well, um, called stabilized stop probing or SIP. So I need to preempt this with Carbon is everywhere. We all know that carbon is absolutely everywhere. We breathe carbon dioxide, our, D our DNA has carbon, it's everywhere. But the most common form of carbon that we have all around us is carbon-12, which corresponds to about 99% of all carbon on Earth. But about 1% of the carbon is carbon-13, which is a very stable carbon isotope with, with the only difference between them being that carbon-13 is slightly heavier because it has more neutrons in its nucleus. So it basically weighs more. So some absolutely genius scientists back in the day decided to take advantage of this um, and discover SIP. So what do we do during a stable isotope probing experiment? We take sediment like before and run incubations, exactly like before. But this time we have one set of incubations that contain uh, DMS and DMSP that have 12 carbon, exactly like we did before. And one set of incubations that have DMS and DMSP where the 12 carbon has been replaced with 13 C carbon. Once the, we again monitor with gas chromatography and once we stop the incubations, we extract the DNA. That's what this part of the graph means. We extract the DNA from it. And then we spin it. We spin it for 
ages for about 40 hours at a speed that is honestly very, very hard, hard to imagine. Um, so it's 44,000 G. And basically astronauts, when they exit Earth or re-enter Earth, experience about 6 G. So we basically spin these guys very, very fast. And hopefully at the end of it, you end up with a separation of the DNA that contains um, the carbon-12 and DNA that contains carbon-13. So we do this um, because we assume that if we feed something 13 carbon and it actively eats it, then its DNA should then contain that heavy carbon. So assuming this, let's look at some gas chromatography results. You guys are probably experts now. So this was done by the wonderful Susie, um, a PhD student in the lab. So she incubated sediment with DMSP. We haven't actually done this with DMS yet. So first of all, that is marsh. So at the top here, you have the, the graph that shows DMS concentrations. So with black are the 12 seed DMSP incubations and with red are the 13 seed DMSP incubations. And you can see it's a different picture from before. DMS accumulates, and there are a few maybe dips, but overall it accumulates in the, uh, in the vials. And at the bottom here, I'm actually showing carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is also seen increasing in the incubations. In the Baltic Sea, on the other hand, say on the other hand, but it's exactly the same picture, um, D DMS, again, can be seen accumulating. We see some dips, which basically could mean that DMS is being degraded, but overall it's accumulating. And again, CO2 is produced in the vials. Um, ignore this part. It's a bit of the elephant in the room with this, uh, this Baltic Sea graph, unfortunately. What happened was that this was about after 75 days, and we use the bunks that we use to seal our bottles. We basically, for each of these measurements, you have to pierce them with a needle. Um, and because we did that for uh, more than 70 times, we got a bit scared that uh, we damaged it too much and it started leaking oxygen. Um, so we, um, we changed the bung here and basically some of the gas escaped, um, but it doesn't really matter. Overall, again, DMS is produced, carbon dioxide is also produced, um, and there's no major degradation. And both these experiments showed something that truly shocked us, if I if I may say that. Uh, there was absolutely no methane. So there was no, no methane production. Now, something I didn't mention earlier is that the trick with SIP incubations is that you want to match nature. So the DMSP that we added in these incubations was the DMSP that we measured in the sediments when we went sampling. So that is the major difference between these incubations and the incubations I showed you earlier, which seems to suggest that the DMS, instead of being degraded, it's actually accumulating and potentially leading to carbon dioxide rather than methane. So this is, I think, one of the coolest results we got. Um, but unfortunately, because we only really started in January, we haven't fully explored this more. Um, so I actually got some results this week, but it's been still being analyzed. So I can't really answer what's going on with the microorganisms. So I'll leave you at that. <laughs> Or I was planning to leave you at that, but it's only we're only 24 minutes uh, in, and Ross said I need to speak for 45 minutes. Um, so I decided to show you some of my uh, PhD results um, to and try and explain what this bits, what these bits of the um, of my future work actually mean. So what I did for my PhD is instead of looking at DMSP, I only looked at DMS degradation. So what I did throughout was incubate sediment with DMS and check if it produces methane or carbon dioxide, right? So let's see what this part of the graph means. What, what does 16 srRNA mean and what does amplicon sequencing mean? So amplicon sequencing or meta barcoding. Um, so this is a very simplified schematic. Um, you basically collect an environmental sample in this case, 
segment and you extract DNA. Then from that DNA, you amplify a DNA marker gene, which basically means you choose a gene that is present in all the organisms um, you want to investigate. So all the organisms are in the sediment, for example. It's different enough between each species to say, ah, yes, you come from an orange, whereas you come from a tomato. It needs to be the same within the species. Um, so basically all oranges need to have the same gene. Um, and once you've chosen this gene, this wonderful gene, um, you basically need to amplify it. So you basically create millions of copies of this gene. So it also needs to be easy to amplify. And this is this is mostly for your benefit, for our benefit, um, because um, coming up with these methods and troubleshooting them could, could take up to six months. It could even take a year if it's a hard gene to amplify. So make it as easy as easy as possible. So once you've done that, you can sequence all the copies uh, of the genes that you amplified, get the DNA sequences, and then you can assign them to specific species. That way you can say, my fruit bowl has oranges, it has mangoes, and it has tomatoes. Um, and you can also give a relative abundance. So you can say, my fruit bowl has 40%, um, um, I don't know, oranges, 59% coconuts. Wow, that's a weird fruit bowl. Um, and 1% uh, mangoes, let's say. So once you've done that, so, so, so we've done this, and so let's look at some results. So first of all, I'll show you results from uh, UK salt marsh, right? I've promised salt marshes, so let's do this. So this is Bathys Marsh in Rochester, which you guys are, know very well now. Um, so th this is this um, weird green shape. Um, so this, the, the results I'll be showing you from now on are from this spot. <clears throat> so the sampling sites are pretty close, so we expect pretty similar results. Um, but the pink spot here is from a marina where people live um, full time, so they could they could be slightly contaminated with um, human sorry um, human DNA. Um, so we just kept that in mind. So gas chromatography results here again, as I said earlier, I incubated with DMS. Um, and again, I add DMS, the DMS goes down. I add more DMS, the DMS continues being degraded. And methane is accumulated. So you guys know what this shows. Um, so let's look at the amplicon sequencing. So here, as a marker gene, I used, um, I used a gene that is specific for all methane producing um, microorganisms. It's called the MCRA. Um, you don't have to remember this, but I will mention it later again. So, <clears throat> so these are the, the results we normally expect. So the different colors are the different microorganisms, so the different groups that we're, uh, we've shown exist in the sediment. So here at the bottom, you have all the different um, samples I had. So S stands for salt marsh, since they're all from a salt marsh. O is original, um, so it's from the sediment as it is in the sampling site. Controls are the controls of the incubation, where basically we just put soil uh, in a serum vial and didn't add anything else besides media. And then the S is the samples, are the samples that have been incubated with DMS as the only carbon and energy source. And as you can probably see, there's a pattern forming. In the controls and in the originals, we see many, many different uh, organisms. Whereas in the samples that have been incubated with DMS, we see the blue guys, methanolobus, completely dominating the incubations. So methanolobus are known DMS degraders. Um, so we're not really surprised that they're there, but we are surprised that they're pretty much the only ones that are degrading DMS in our incubations. So methanolobus in the UK salt marsh. What happens in the Baltic Sea? So this is a graph that you've seen previously. Um, and again, you know you know the drill now. DMS goes down. We add DMS, DMS goes down. Methane is produced and accumulating and accumulates in the samples. So what happens in the applicant sequencing? So here, 
Um, again, similar graph um, for O, S, and C. The D is depth. Um, so I had different seven different depths for the Baltic Sea. So D1 was at the sea floor, so about one centimeter at the sea floor, um, uh, all the way to D7, which was about 65 centimeters, I believe, below the sea floor. So the DMS incubated samples appear now with an arrow. And once again, we see methanolobus completely dominating after the addition of DMS. So it seems that in brackish sediments, so in sediments that have an intermediate salinity, methanolobus is the one that is actively degrading DMS and leading to the production of methane. So we know this, which means that we know, we, you guys also know, how we can explore the diversity of the DMS and DMSP degrading microorganisms. And maybe if methane was produced in the SIP incubations, we would end up with the same methanolobus taking over. Um, but since methane wasn't produced, it will be interesting to see who, who is the one doing the job. So how do we explore the metabolism? So going back here, I mentioned metagenomics. <clears throat> so what is metagenomics or shotgun metagenomics as it's uh, no, more formally, let's say, known? So this is the sch same schematic I showed you before um, for the amplicon sequencing. But the only difference is that we don't use a marker gene. We don't amplify for one. Samples which contain a mixture of DNA in our case, the sediment. So they have multiple organisms. The DNA is fragmented and sent for sequencing. So this can once again give you all the genes in the sample. Um, but as an extra bonus, because you uh, sequence all genes, um, you can gain information regarding the function of these genes and how, what's, what all the species that you have in, the, in your sample. And this can help predict what each species could be doing in the environment and potentially show the community networks that could be uh, forming. So how certain microbes could be interacting with each other. So I only did this for the Baltic Sea. So these are the results I'll be showing you. And there you go. So I sent DMS incubated samples, uh, which I know have methanolobus in them, and I got 125 genes that are that are involved in methane, sulfur, DMSP, and DMS. Um, so <laughs> this is a pretty crazy graph. Uh, and I know because I went a bit crazy when I was trying to make this last year. Um, so I'll move on and I'll only show you some key genes specific for methane production. So methanogenesis. Methanogenesis is the fancy word fancy Greek word for methane production. So what we know from the literature is that specific compounds that lead to the production of methane have specific genes that degrade them. What does this mean? Let's say we there's a methanogen and we feed it methanol. Specific methanol genes will be expressed and the proteins will be produced. Let's say we add DMS, specific genes will be expressed for that for in order to degrade the DMS to methane. Um, these genes do a similar, similar job. So they all do exactly the same, and I'll show you what they do. But they are specific per compound. So methanogenesis from DMS. So this is DMS, um, the chemical formula. And the thing you need to be focusing on is just this methyl group, CH3, and that's what, that's why I've highlighted it. So let's say that um, a methanolobus, since we know it's degrading DMS in the Baltic Sea, comes across DMS. What does it do? Well, it expresses a DMS-specific gene and converts into a protein and produces the protein called MTSA. This MTSA then takes the snug little methyl group and gives it to another DMS specific uh, protein called MTSB. So once this happened, 
Methalopus is okay. It says, okay, we need to we need to figure out what to do with this. Like I need to gain my energy somehow. So it expresses a coenzyme M. And MTSA says, okay, I'll take the methyl group from the DMS specific MTSB gene and give it to coenzyme M. But the problem is coenzyme M, in order for coenzyme M to be produced, a lot of energy need to, needs to be spent. So methanolobus wants to recycle this. So it needs to somehow take the methyl group away in order to um, end up with its coenzyme M back. So what it decides to do is spend a coenzyme B and says to the MCR complex, which is a, a, a complex of four proteins, um, which are can be found in all in nearly all methane producing organisms. And it tells it, please give me back my coenzyme M. And then it, uh, it and that's what the MCR does, um, and it ends up producing methane as a byproduct. So this is how methane is produced from DMS. So we have the DMS specific genes, which if, for example, it was trying to degrade methanol, these will be different. And it, it also uses the MCR complex, which is specific for all uh, methane producing organisms. Which means our 125 graph, uh, gene graph turns into six. So, as I mentioned before, methanolobus seems to be doing the job. So let's send these one of these guys for metagenomics. What do we end up with? So these are the six genes I was talking to you about. We have the MCRA, B, C, and D, so the complex, and the two um, DMS-specific genes or proteins, I guess. So this is called a heat map. Um, all missing values, so if the gene hasn't been found in the sample, um, we color it with gray. Um, and then if the gene is in low abundance, it's in orange, and then it slowly goes to purple and blue as the abundance increases, uh, the abundance of the genes increases. So we can see that the MCR complex is very highly expressed. It, we, we can find it we can find high a high abundance of these genes in the samples, which is something we were expecting. Like we know, we know methanolobus is producing methane here. But the truly surprising thing, and actually one of the biggest, my biggest results uh, from my PhD, is that the MTS genes, which are specific for the DMS degradation, are either not there or in very low abundance. And this was well, this was crazy. I, I never expected this to, to find something like this. We know that DMS is being degraded, so 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 who's doing the job? So let's look at the other um, compounds that have similar properties to DMS. So they also have a methyl group. And as I said earlier, we know the genes that are involved in the methanogenesis for these compounds, they're compound specific. So we have methanol, methylamine, dimethylamine, and trimethylamine. So let's add these to our heat map. So with green is methanol, Methylamine is with red, dimethylamine is with blue, and trimethylamine is with pink. And I would like to say here that all of these can be found uh, in nature. So shockingly, um, especially for methanol and trimethylamine genes, so these guys and these guys, their abundance in my samples was very, very high, which seems to suggest that um, that compound specificity isn't that that we've assumed is happening up till now might not actually be the case. So, yeah, which which is it's cra it's crazy in my field at least. So I I don't know what this means. And we were trying to further prove this with SIP, but again, since methane, I'm I'm not bitter about it at all. But since methane isn't being produced, um, yeah, it'll be a bit weird to see how we uh, manage to show this a bit further. So with that, we've also I've also shown you how we can explore the metabolism of microorganisms. But what does this mean? Why why should you guys care about it? Like, don't get me wrong. I think you've understood understood here that I find my research extremely interesting and cool. But why should you care about it? In all honesty, I don't really know what this means for the future. And that's why I believe research like this is important. 
So overall, our data shows that a climate cooling gas, which is actually the most abundant sulfur compound in the atmosphere, with more than 300 million uh, tons being produced each year, leads to the production of methane and carbon dioxide, two major greenhouse gases responsible for climate change. So <clears throat> will this be affected by the increase in temperature and water level rise that climate change will cause in the near future? Very likely. Um, but what happens to the produced methane or the CO2? Uh, will it be released? Will it be stored in the sediment? Does it just stay there and be used up by other microbes? It might, but certain fishing operations like trawling, which basically scrapes the bottom of the sediment uh, of the seafloor, or drilling for oil, like in the North Sea, for example, disturb these sediments, releasing the produced methane and carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And actually, full methane, they add to this very scary graph where it's showing the global average um, atmospheric methane abundance since the 1980s, and it's ever increasing. So I understand, I understand that, you know, it's a time when sc scaremongering is, is normal, and seeing headlines like this are extremely normal. <laughs> so I do understand this, but there is still so much that we don't know about ecology and about the microbiology that surrounds us. So what I'm trying to say is that this research might not have a direct effect at the moment, but it's basically a small push forward of our knowledge boundaries, and it will hopefully help us understand how methane is produced a bit better and eventually maybe help us help us predict future methane emissions. Because at the end of the day, we can't we can't really change something that we don't know is out there. So with that, hopefully positive, but also maybe not that positive note, <laughs> I would like to end. Um, but first I'd like to thank my advisor, Osge, Ian for absolutely always getting muddy for me. You can actually see him carrying my quarters there. Uh, and all the amazing humans in Osga's group, I honestly couldn't, couldn't do anything without them. Um, and same goes for all our funding bodies who continue to support this cool research. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>